today's topic for me, the scripture, Ray and I were talking about this, our team was talking about this. This one makes me a little uncomfortable. And it's a little uncomfortable because honestly, I don't hear this talked about with the end times. And so when I go there, it's kind of like, all right, let's go there with this, but just keep testing it. It's nothing radical. Uh, but I think that the upper room models this so well of what is one of the signs and one of the indicators. Uh, you ready for this one? For the end times. And I love uh, congregations, churches, ministries that help usher us into his presence in worship and in prayer. And uh, sometimes I think we elevate teaching so much in America that we forget sometimes the worship side of things. Now, I'm not talking about elevating it to the point where it's unhealthy. I think you get my point here, but I'm going there because to me, um, this all fits. It's crazy, doesn't it, Ray? Yep. You're just excited because it's swirly today. Yeah. yeah. Ray loves swirly theological topics. <laughs> what, is, what does that even mean, Ray, swirly? Well, it, you know, it's, it's a little more of a mystery. It's not so black and white. It yeah. invites us into the journey. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the last two lessons, we've talked about two main groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, this Jewish and Gentile language is the topic today, and, and if people have a hard time, now, what do the Jews think of the Gentiles now coming into the picture? Right? This is what we've been talking about. The Jews said no, the Gentiles said yes, but now you have the Jews saying, wait a minute, what are you talking about? They're a part of us now. So you have to integrate that into the end times because if they came, if Christ came to them first, you got to start stirring up this emotion, yes, in how the Jews feel. The only way I can address how the Jews feel is in Acts 15. And if you would, would you go to Acts 15, verse 1? And in Acts 15, verse 1, it says this, Some men, uh, they came down from Judea, and they began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised. According to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. So here you have what we would call uh, false brethren. Okay, they, they're coming out of Antioch. They're these legalistic Judaizers. That's really who they are. They're Jewish teachers, legalistic. And we know in verse five later on, they're Pharisees. But they're part of this Jerusalem Antioch congregations. And they're coming to the table and they're saying, hey, hang on. Anybody that's talking about saying yes to the Messiah you know what you got to do. It's not just faith in Christ. You have to be circumcised. You got to be circumcised as prescribed. Prescribed, I mean, it's like all of a sudden Moses is a doctor, seriously. And he says, this is the way that you have to go in order to follow God. This is the prescription. Circumcision is essential. And he even says all of these, these folks, and, and what I, I, Warren Wearsby is a great commentator. He, uh, he passed away a couple years ago. But he calls these first five verses the, the dispute. You're going to have the dispute between the Jews and the believers. That's what's taking place. These quote-unquote believers, they've got to get circumcised. So this is the conversation. This is the issues that they are having. Strangely enough, you need to know, Romans, at this point, Ray, was it written? <laughs> no. Hebrews was not written, and Galatians was not written. And I think that's important to understand because those books talk about freedom in the Lord. Does that make sense? And here, they don't have it. These Judaizers, they don't know. They're just, they're learning what this looks like. So I would say cut some of these guys some slack, but the reality is, is they're pushing the envelope. So when you get to verse two, it says, but after Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, uh, what do we see? It says the church arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem concerning this controversy. So Paul and Barnabas are coming up against a group of people that we'd call the Judaizers. The Judaizers would claim to actually be a part of the believers. But they're saying, hey, look, in order to be saved, you have to do what, Ray? What do you have to add to this? Circumcision. Circumcision. But they didn't just stop there. They typically would add more to it, which is why Paul wrote the book right. of Galatians. That's right. So there's this <laughs> list that there is what we would call, there's this massive dispute. And so they're going to bring in the ringleaders. Can you imagine Paul coming to the table? Paul's coming to the table with his buddy Barnabas, and it says in verse 3, and this is what I love, right? They're on their way. On the way to Jerusalem, they have been sent on their way by the church. They passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria. You know why I love this? Because an apostle, a true man of God, never stops talking about the Lord. 
He's not so focused about this famous Jerusalem council, this famous debate, that when he sees people, guess what he's doing? He's testifying about the Lord every step of the way. When you've been radically changed by Jesus, you cannot turn this thing off. And I think sometimes when we become so educational, so religious, you forget about that relationship side. And Paul says, no, no, that's the reason I'm coming to Jerusalem. So he tells people in Phoenicia and Samaria, explaining in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. And they created great joy among all the brothers. So as Paul is going into these two locations, he's testifying and everybody's experiencing great joy. When there is true salvation, there's freedom. There's joy. And Paul hasn't even got to the discussion yet. He's just telling everybody. So you know what he's not concerned about? The religious people. He's coming to debate it and he doesn't even care. He's going to keep talking about it over and over and over. And he says in verse four, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. So Paul gets the big old welcome sign in Jerusalem. The church, the elders, everybody say, come on in. And it says, and, and what did Paul and Barnabas do? They testified about all of the Gentiles hearing the gospel. When you know it's of God, you have nothing to fear about your testimony. I mean, nothing. And so it says in verse five, but some of the believers from the party of the Pharisees, that's how we know they're the Pharisees. They stood up and they said, it is necessary to to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Typical religious person. This does not fit into our scope, but what they should have known, this is what drives me crazy about religious people. If they really are religious, they should know the word better than anybody. And all throughout the Old Testament, Ray, it talks about the Gentiles will be blessed from God. Prophetically speaking, the prophets were talking about, oh, by the way, this is going to happen. Go to Genesis 22, verse 18. Genesis 22, verse 18. They should know that the Gentiles will be blessed through Israel, right? Through, through uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All the nations of the earth will what? Be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. What did the Pharisees actually think? How did they think they were going to be blessed, Ray? Yeah, it's, it's through keeping the law, through works. Uh, Kevin, can you just go to, let's go to Isaiah 49, verse 6. Isaiah 49, verse 6. There's plenty of texts in the Old Testament, by the way, that shows that the Gentiles will be blessed. It says in Isaiah 49, 6, it is, it is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation, what? To the ends of the earth. So when salvation begins to take place, what do the Pharisees do? Kevin? set because in their mind they had to go through all the work yeah and they're set apart these guys didn't get half i mean they just get this freedom so here's what i've really learned about the religious they don't really know the word i say it again i actually really believe that the religious don't really know the word if they knew the word, they would know it points to the Messiah. If they knew the word, they would know that he's offering true freedom. So when Paul's going to Phoenicia and he's going to Samaria and he's everywhere talking about the Gentiles, like to me, they should know, yes, we are the reason that they're being blessed. Instead, they push him away. And I think for me, the dispute is, wait a minute, are you telling me that the Gentiles are a part of us? That's the dispute. But when you get into this, you can see in verses 6 through 18, I'm in Acts 15 again, you're going to hear what Wearsby says, it's called a defense. You have the dispute, and now you're going to hear what we would call, right, the defense. That makes sense. It says, and the apostles and the elders assembled to consider this matter. Ray, just a clarity, what's the matter again? Yeah, it's, it's whether uh, Gentiles have to keep the law and be circumcised. Verse 7, it says, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and he said to them, brothers, you are aware that in the early days, God made a choice among you. I love this. That by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. So here's what I want to do here. Ray, who's talking right now, just out of curiosity? Peter. Peter is talking. In the debate, what he says is he says, hey, by the way, God chose Peter 
preach the gospel to who? Gentiles. The Gentiles. So now remember, this is a part of his, uh, of his defense, right? He goes, you should know I'm here. I'm supposed to preach. In fact, who did, who did Jesus give the keys of the kingdom to? But Peter. Just even that fact alone, even that truth alone should say, hey, by the way, I've been asked to do this by the Messiah. This isn't anything new. And then he just says this. He says in verse 8, and God who knows the heart testified to them. Who's them? Gentiles, by giving the Holy Spirit just as he did also to us. Who's us? The Jews. The Holy Spirit came to the Gentiles just as the Holy Spirit came to the Jews. So in this, I think you got to understand, God gave the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. And one of the main reasons, not the only one, for the Holy Spirit is to bear witness. Right? To empower. So that we can show who we are that we've been born again. That whoever believes. So you have God chose Peter to what? Preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Then he gave the Holy Spirit so that they would bear witness that they've been born again. In verse 9, he made no distinction. I'm back in Acts 15. He made no distinction between us and them. The Jews and the Gentiles. Cleansing their hearts by faith. That's huge. Why is that huge, Ray? Well, it's, it's saying, you know, as Paul says, there's in, in him, in Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Greek. That's right. It's uh, God makes no distinction. There's neither male nor female. It's uh, back to the, you know, the passage in Amos that he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. All flesh. Kevin, can you go to Ephesians 2, if you don't mind for me? Ephesians 2, 12 through 18. You will see, and Warren Wiersbe spells this out very well, the gospel erased the difference. Ephesians 2, 12 through 18, uh, it says, At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, with no hope and without God in the world. Ray, who's he talking about right there? He's talking to the Gentiles. The Gentiles. He's saying, hey, you guys had no hope. You weren't a part of us. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. Because of the Gentiles, because of Christ, you're now near. And Ephesians 2.14 says, He is our peace who made both, both groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, He tore down the dividing wall of hostility. And in His flesh, He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that He might create in Himself. So I want to tell you this. This is the work of the Lord. He says, so he could create in himself one new man from two. Who's the two, right? Just again. Yes, the Jew and Gentile. The Jew and the Gentile. We're overstating this. But this is a part of God's plan in the end times, that the Jew and the Gentile, through Christ, become one. Resulting in peace, it says at the end of 15, but in 16, it says he did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross and put the hostility to death by it, right? This is one of the reasons in the millennium there's a thousand years of peace. Why? Because there's he, he tore down the wall between Jew and Gentile, and between Gentile and Gentile, there's going to be peace yeah. because everything is reconciled in Him. Amen. Ephesians 2.17 says, When Christ came, He proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away. Can I just tell you guys, whenever you see people dealing with anxiety, whenever you see people dealing with loneliness or depression, you go to any coffee shop, I guarantee you, you'll find one. And you start speaking the language of peace, it will resonate almost with every person. We are all longing for that peace, and that peace can only come from Christ. These people that feel so far away, that peace will draw them, yes, to Him and, and peace to those who were near. And finally, in verse 18, Ephesians 2 18 says, For through Him we both, look at that, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. So when, Paul said, uh, when Peter's talking about this, the gospel erased the difference. Yes, it did, right? Uh, you know, a great parable about this is the, the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal yeah. son comes home, reconciled back to the father. The one that's angry is the religious older brother. Yeah. And I think it's a great picture of old and new covenant. Acts 15, verse 10. And this is the fourth point that I like that Wearsby says on here. It's just in, in verse 4, or number 4, sorry. 
It says in Acts 15, 10, now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? So ultimately, what he's saying is, and I like this, is that there has been, the gospel has brought removal of the yoke of law. Uh, a couple of verses here. Can you go to Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine? 29? Remember, all of this, right? All of this is a picture of the Gentiles experiencing freedom. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. All of you take up my yoke, this is Christ talking, and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For some weird reason, these Judaizers, these Pharisees, they wanted to impose more rather than less. It's a control factor. It's a spirit of religion that is carrying over from the old covenant and it's battling against the new covenant. Ray? You know, the first time you see this expressed is when the serpent is talking to Eve and she says, we can't eat from it or touch it. And religion always adds to, I didn't say anything about touching it. And I think there's kind of a mentality of putting so many commands that I can't even get to the act that's forbidden. And Paul talks about that when he, he says, he actually calls it doctrine of demons. He says, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. You know, that these things look like, you know, they're beneficial, but have no ability to control the flesh. Yeah, amen. Galatians 5.1, it says this, Christ has liberated us to be free. Watch this. Stand firm Woo. then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Amen. You're done with the old way of doing things. And so what you see here is a, a really unique uh, four process of Acts 15. Remember, this is a, a debate right? This is what we're seeing, the dispute, the defense, and this defense continues on. It says in verse 11, on the contrary, Peter is still talking, right? We believed we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. Enough right there. If you want to know what the gospel is, here it is. We're saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't add anything else, you guys. That's it. You don't have to pray more people into something. Once they're here, it's yes. I've actually been in a theological conversation this week about people adding things to the scriptures, and it's not even there. You talked about these doctrines that people are creating. That's our problem. We add things to justify our control. We add things to justify our theology. He says, man, we're saved through grace in the same way they are. In other words, we're on the same page, Jews and Gentiles. And then in verse 12, <laughs> then the whole assembly fell silent and listened to Paul, uh, to Barnabas and Paul. Now, Peter was just talking. Can, can you imagine this whole dream team? Paul, Peter's talking. All right, next up, you two. You know what I love about this is now Barnabas is talking, not Paul. Paul this is really interesting. Like Barnabas is listed first. A lot of people would say, and this is pure speculation, but at the beginning, Barnabas was the one as the Jew, right, that helped Paul understand. So maybe he has a better connection with the Jews. I don't really know. But they both began describing all the signs and the wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When there's a testimony, people can, they can refute it by just not believing. But when God shows up, it really is hard to argue. That's why for me, it's so important that you're not just studying this thing, you're living it. To number our days, you want to combat the spirit of religion? Have a life that reflects freedom. And I think for me, that's exactly what's happening to Barnabas and Paul. They're just telling story after story of God showing up, God showing up. You know what happens? The religious say, I don't know. Or some will say, I want that. That's my prayer is that through the spirit of God, he'll start drawing people unto him. And what you see in verse 13 and back in Acts 15, 13, it says, they stop speaking. So Barnabas and Paul are done. Now enter in another superhero of faith, James. 
right? James and John, right? This is the guys that ran with Jesus. He's one of the pillars, you guys, of the Jerusalem church. He's the half-brother of Christ. And it says, all right, brothers, listen to me. Now that you've heard Paul, now that you've heard Peter, uh, now, okay, I'm next. And interesting enough, in Acts 15, verse 14, he says, Simeon has reported how God first intervened. He used the Simeon, I believe, to connect with the Jewish culture. Names mean everything. And even in this defense, he understands how to connect with people. Simeon had reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. You guys, what does this mean that God has first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name? Ray, you got any thoughts on that? No, I, I mean, it's just, I believe it's God's desire all along expressed through Abraham yeah. that, you know, uh, Paul calls him the father of all who believe. And, you know, he asked the question, did the passage where it says that he believed and God credited it for righteousness. And he asked the question, was that before or after he was circumcised? <laughs> it was before. Yeah. And then he received the sign of salvation to the Jew, circumcision. That's the reason he's the father of both. Yeah. And I believe it was God's heart all along. And like the Messianic Psalm we saw, I guess it was last week or the week before, that where the Father's talking to Jesus, ask me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Amen. Amen. So when you see this back in Acts 15, 14, you know what he's saying? You guys should know this, by the way. Simeon reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And then he backs it up with Old Testament scripture. So he makes the disclaimer, and now he says, and you should know this. He says in Acts 15, 15, at the Jerusalem council, James is confronting and talking to the Judaizers, the legalistic Pharisees that say you can only be saved through faith and by circumcision and by keeping the law. He says, no, 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 you should know this. In Acts 15, 15, the words of the prophets agree with this. What I'm saying in verse 14, what I'm now just saying is that the Gentiles are going to be blessed. It's going to come to fruition in Acts 15, 15. He says in, in 16, he says, after these things, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again. We're going to hang out in verse 16 for a while. So, all right, James is talking to the legalistic Pharisees, and he throws out this end times text that should totally confirm everything that we've been going through. He says, after these things, by the way, we'll get into this. He's reciting Amos 9. Okay, Amos 9, and he gets into really, uh, I'll just say 11 and 12 right now. But he gets into this, into this conversation. Now, Ray, just so we're clear, when he says after these things, what is he alluding to? Well, um, he's just talking about, I believe, the progression of time before we get to the very end. So it's, you know, we can look at this in a very rigid timeline sometimes mm -hmm. when we say after these things. Um, but I believe this progression from, uh, you know, Paul talked about, I mean, uh, Peter, we're in the last days since Pentecost. And so there's a progression of building. And so I just believe he's talking about as we get to the end, we're going to see the rebuilding of uh, David's tabernacle, his Good. tent. And here's what I want to say, okay? This language of David's fallen tent. I'm going to back up. I'm going to go into Chronicles. I'm going to back up. I'm going to go into 2 Samuel. So you're going to see how this keeps backing up. So remember, in the book of Acts, the Jerusalem council is here. They're mad because people are coming to know Christ, these Gentiles, and they're not adhering to the Jewish law, okay? This is the language, okay? So now he's reciting. He said, you guys should know these things. And he says, this David's fallen tent. How would you, Ray, this is maybe a little bit of a bigger question, that David's fallen tent is called the Tabernacle of David, okay? Are we talking about uh, an actual physical rebuilding? Because this is not the temple. Correct. Make the difference, will you? Well, for a long time, you know, when I, when I would see that, I just automatically thought temple, which I think a lot of us do. But a, but a tabernacle is different, uh, you know, than the temple. And the tabernacle was a tent. And I won't, I know you're going to get into the whole story, so I don't want, I don't want to get ahead of you, but, but it's, it's a different manifestation of God's presence yeah. than the temple. You know, there was uh, the, the tabernacle of Moses, which was a tent where the Ark of the Covenant was, and then David had a different expression of it that you're going to get into in more detail, but that is a separate thing than the temple. 
And so when he's talking about the rebuilding of this tent, you know, uh, I believe it's a lot more than physical. Okay, so you're going to have, you ready for this? The tabernacle of David and the temple in the millennium. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. You're going to have the tabernacle of David. I'll describe and go into that teaching what that is. And the temple uh, in the temple in the thousand year uh, millennium, in the thousand year period, and they're both going to coexist. Okay, go to Amos 9, and we're going to try to figure out why is he quoting the minor prophet Amos. Okay, so that's where I want to go to today, if we can. In Amos 9, but start in verse 9, if you would, Kevin. Amos 9, 9, you got to give up a little bit of a backdrop. Okay, Amos 9, 9 says, For I am about to give the command. I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations. Okay, as one shakes a, a sieve. Did I say that right? A sieve. But not a pebble, pebble will fall to the ground. So imagine just a salt shaker, and out falls these little small grains, right? That's the Israelites. That's the remnant. But the pebbles, okay, those that are coming after him, those that want to destroy Israel, they're staying in. So what he's saying is, I'm going to spread my people all over. Kevin, what happened after David and Solomon's reign? It got messy and they went all over. After David and Solomon's reign, all of the Israelites were dispersed. So now you hear this language, I'm going to rebuild David's fallen temp, uh, tabernacle, his tent. I'm going to rebuild that. So what does that imply, Kevin? If they're dispersed everywhere, what does it look like then? It means they're coming back together. It, it means they're coming back. So when he's talking about restoring, repairing, rebuilding, he's going to start, I want you to have this mindset, he's going to start bringing the Jews back to him. It's important to understand. This fallen booth is now going to imply my people are going to come to me. Right now they're dispersed. Amos 9.10 says, And all the saints, all the sinners among my people who say disaster will never overtake or confront us will die by the sword. You know what he says there? There's going to be no more fighting. In the millennium, you're done taking over my people. I'm restoring my people back to me. And in Amos 9, 11, this is what uh, James quotes. In that day, I will restore the fallen booth of David. So what are you seeing now? You're seeing the restoration of the Jews. Don't worry, we're going to get into even more of that, okay? Remember, this is swirly. You got to hang in here with me. I will repair its gaps, restore its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of of old. What is the days of old? Right. If he's going to rebuild it, restore it, repair it, what is Amos talking about? I believe he's talking about uh, David yeah. and his revelation that he got, which is how, why he established uh, this unique expression at a time that totally violated the prescribed way of worship under the Mosaic Covenant. And he got a revelation of this, and I believe that's what he's restoring. All right. Uh, James in Acts 15 is talking about the, the Jews being restored back to him. Okay, right now that's the only language that we have. In Amos, a minor prophet, guess what he's saying? He's saying, hey, this tabernacle that's fallen apart, this fallen booth of David's, guess what? It's going to come back to the days of old. So you've got to go back to that. What's the days of old? Now I want you to go to 1 Chronicles. Okay, hopefully you guys are with me. 1 Chronicles 13. 1 Chronicles 13, what I'm going to do is, is there's, there's 14 verses. I'm just going to kind of bullet point it so you can see because i got to cover two chapters here. Okay, now in verse 3, it says this. David has this, this uh, it says, Then let us, David is saying, let us bring the ark of our God, for we did not inquire of him in Saul's days. So David is now saying, hey, we want the ark back. Now, Kevin? It was with the Philistines. That's right. And so uh, the ark, just so you know, in the ark, Kevin, it's fair to say we would have the Ten Commandments, right? Correct. And so Aaron's rod. So the law was with, you ready? Kevin said this earlier and Ray said this earlier. The law is in the ark. So we're not, dis uh, we're not destroying the law. We're not abol abolishing the prophets. Jesus says, no, I'm coming to fulfill. Acts 15 talks about the fulfillment of First Chronicles, not all of it yet, but some of it in First Chronicles 13. So David has this mentality. And by the way, Kevin said that his ark was with the Philistines. It was with Bet Shemesh and Kiriath Jerim. So this ark was in the quote unquote enemy's hands. And David says, I want the ark back. When you get into verse four, all of the people, it says the proposal assembly, everybody's like, yeah, let's do it. 
So all of the Israelites said, we're in. We want the ark back. You get into verse 5. Again, it says this. Uh, David assembled all of Israel. And it went from the Shehor of Egypt to the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from kiriath Jerim. And so everybody's in. We're going to do this. Now in verse 6, it says in 1 Chronicles 13, 6, David and all Israel went to Bala, kiriath Jerim, which belongs to Judah, to take the ark of the God. From there it is called by the name of the Lord who dwells between the cherubim. So... Uh, Kevin, they ended up doing what? What did they do? They put it on an ox cart and started back for Jerusalem. They put it on an ox cart. All of the Israelites put it on an ox cart. And then, Kevin, what happened from the rest of this story? A uh, guy tried to keep it from falling off the ox cart. He died, and they put it at Obed-Edom's house and went back to Jerusalem without the ark. That's right. So Uzzah, right? And Ahia, I don't know, something like that, right? Uh, Ahio, not Ohio, Ahio, right? It just starts to fall. David's all excited, right? They're celebrating at this point with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines. And as Kevin said, it stumbles, one guy touches it, and then God just says, you're dead. And you know what they said? You know what? We're good. We don't really need the ark right now. And so in this context, I, I do want you to go to verse 11, Kevin, if you would. Uh, 1 Chronicles 13, verse 11, David was angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. So he named that place, it was really uh, original, outburst against Uzzah. So David feared God that day and he said, how can I ever bring the ark of God to me? So then he unpacks it and he says uh, in verse 13, so David did not move the ark of God, home to the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with Obed-Edom's family. We'll welcome the ark of the Lord. Well, why do I have it? Because it killed that guy if he touched it. Kids don't touch this. Right? Can you imagine that conversation in the house? He probably just moved out. But it didn't. He didn't because it says the Lord blessed his family and all that he had. He had the presence of the Lord and he was blessed. Right? Talk about Obed Edom, will you? Just read. Yeah, one. so one, I just want to make one comment. It's interesting that the Philistines who were Gentiles when they stole the ark, and I believe they thought of it as some kind of magic potion to win battles with, they broke out into tumors. Yeah. And they're like, come get this thing. Yeah. Obed-Edom is also a Gentile, brought into his house, he welcomed the presence of God in, and he gets his socks blessed off for three months. And David, when he goes back, he's trying to study why did that happen to Uzziah, he realizes it could only be carried by Levites on poles. Yeah. And then he hears about Obed-Edom, a Gentile, in the presence of God getting his socks blessed off. And I believe he got a revelation of the new covenant. Okay. Did you catch that? He got a revelation of the new covenant. He experienced the presence of the Lord differently than anybody else up until this point. And by the way, Obed-Edom, a Gentile, got blessed. So in this process, Jews and Gentiles are getting blessed when they honor and respect and fear the Lord, right? And under the law, under the Mosaic Covenant, no one could go around the ark except the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Yeah. And here this Gentile That's right. is sitting in the presence of God 24-7 <laughs> for three months. Yeah. And David's like, and he didn't die. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that was an experiment. I don't know, but he got a revelation. Okay, I got to slow down. Remember the context of Acts 15. Acts 15, here you have James arguing, defending in front of Jews. Yes, Gentiles can experience the presence of the Lord. And he says, we have to restore the fallen tent of David. Why? Because he realizes a couple things. One, a Gentile got blessed by the presence of the Lord. Two, uh, <laughs> This is a really obvious one. Like, how do I phrase this, Lord? There's freedom in experiencing his presence. So James's argument is quoting Amos, and Amos is referencing David, which is ultimately saying the Davidic covenant has to be fulfilled. The Davidic covenant points to the coming Messiah, the branch, uh, uh, the, the, um, the shoot of Jesse, the branch of David. Like these are the languages that he's referencing. I know it sounds kind of a lot at this point, but James knows what he's talking about. 
And he's going right at the heart of the religious. And you should know this text, he says. And so here's what I want to do. I want to go to 1 Chronicles 15. Remember, they got the ark. 1 Chronicles 15, verse 1, David built houses for himself in the city, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Now, I will say this, Ray, we had said that the tabernacle of David is not a physical, but in this context, it is. Yes. Okay? In this context, it is. In the millennial, Ray, it's not. No, I believe it's this uh, expression of worship that's uh, going to be described where, you know, even when his tabernacle was in Jerusalem, the tabernacle of Moses was still there, yeah. which is where the ark was supposed to be. But because of this revelation, uh, David put it in one room instead of behind a curtain where the high priest could only go in one day a year. Yeah. Now you've got the worship of God 24-7 where there's only one room, there's no division, and there's Jew and Gentile in that room worshiping God. So watch this. Amen. In First Chronicles 15, Kevin, go to verse 3. He's starting to prepare a place. In verse 3, he says, He assembled all of Israel to bring the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. When you get to verses 4 through 14, here you have what's called the Levites and the priests. And what are the Levites and the priests doing? They're getting ready to receive the presence of the Lord. The Levites and the priests are getting ready to receive the presence of the Lord. When you go to verse 15, this time it's different. Then the Levites carried the ark of God the way Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord on their shoulders with the poles. So here's what I want to say. When there's freedom, there still is order. When there's freedom, there still is order. It doesn't mean you're this loose cannon walking in lawlessness and walking in sinfulness. No, no, no. There's still order. That's why the law is there. It's got these, these rails for us to walk and express in freedom. Now, when you keep going, okay, go to verses 16 through 24. Now you have the Levites and priests getting ready, but you also have the musicians and the gatekeepers getting ready. When you get to 1 Chronicles 15, verses 24, David, it says, in verse 24, it says, uh, the priest, uh, Shabaniah, Jehoshaphat, Nathaniel, Amasiah, Zechariah, Benaniah, Eliezer, they were to blow the trumpets before the ark of God. And then look at this, Obed-Edom, the Gentile who had favor, he was what? To be a gatekeeper for the ark. You don't bring a Gentile, you guys, into this. That's a huge religious no-no. But all of a sudden, you have a picture, and this is key with Obed-Edom, a Gentile and a Jew are getting ready to experience the presence of the Lord. Why does James say this in Acts 15? Because we've got to go back to that. I've already shown you what this looks like. Quit your arguing about these things. I've already told you this is coming. And so verses uh, 25 says, David and the elders uh, and the commanders of thousands went with rejoicing to the Ark of the Covenant. They're, they're singing, they're rejoicing in all of this. In verses 26 and 27, David gets dressed. And he just says, uh, and there is a second. Let's go to 27, Kevin. David was dressed in a robe of fine linen, as well as, as were all the Levites who were carrying the ark, as well as the singers and Chananiah, the music leader of the singers. David also wore a linen ephod. You know what this means? Everybody is, I, I'm going to go extreme here. It, it looks like they're really getting ready for a big old wedding. I know they're not, but it looks like they're getting ready for the best. He's coming, the presence. And, and in 28, it says, So Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant with shouts, the sound of the ram's horns, trumpets, cymbals, and the playing of harps and lyres. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the heart of the city, uh, it says the city of David, sorry, Saul's daughter Michael, that's David's wife, looked down from the window. She saw King David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. David's own wife rejected Saul, or rejected, sorry, David, because he was in full freedom, because I believe Ray's right. This is a picture of the new covenant. Now, I love this. Uh, uh, Rich Goodwin helped me find this. There's a guy named Kevin Connor. I just want to go through this really quickly. The differences between the, uh, uh, the temple, right? Uh, and uh, you want to say something, Ray? I, I do before you. Okay, go for it. Uh, it's interesting that Michael looked at David, and because of his free expression of worship before God, she was offended. And 
if you look at the rest of the story, it says, and David basically said, if you think that was something, yeah. you're, you're going to watch me really cut loose. <laughs> and it says that Michael was bearing the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's, an ex that's, that's a picture of the religious spirit getting offended yeah. by the free worship yeah. and being spiritually barren. Yeah. You know, Kevin Connor, he, he lists the difference between, uh, Ray, uh, Rich, what were the differences between what and what? There are the differences between the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David. Okay, so you have, it really, it, you wouldn't think there'd be much, but here you have the tabernacle of Moses, right? And then you have the tabernacle of David. In the tabernacle of David, you heard incorporated singers in worship. By the way, you, you never really saw that except at Mount Gibeon at the tabernacle of Moses. So to see people singing, that's really kind of odd. There's instruments in the tabernacle of David, but you never saw any instruments with the tabernacle of Moses. Uh, I love this one. The, the Levites uh, ministered before the ark. Only, Ray alluded to this, only the high priest. So what you see is, is that the ministers could come before the presence of the Lord, but only one could with the uh, tabernacle of Moses. I love this. The ministry of thankfulness took place with the tabernacle of David in 1 Chronicles 15. You don't see any ministry of thankfulness with the tabernacle of Moses. You see a ministry in the tabernacle of David filled with praise. In the tabernacle of Moses, you really don't see that. You see uh, psalm, yeah, psalms, psalm singing, but you don't see that with the Moses uh, side. You see clapping in the tabernacle of David. You don't see that in the tabernacle of Moses. They're shouting, by the way, in the tabernacle of David, and there's no shouting with the tabernacle of Moses. There's dancing like David did in the tabernacle of David. In the tabernacle of Moses, there's really not a whole lot of dancing. And I even want to go so far, and I like what Kevin Connor said, there's, there's spiritual sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices in uh, the tabernacle of David and not with the tabernacle of Moses. Very, very few. It would be the animal sacrifices, but not the spiritual sacrifices. Why do we bring all of this up? Because I believe all of this is indicators of the end times. It will come down to religion versus relationship. There's a drastic feel of a spirit of religion in the church. But when you have freedom, can I just tell you this? In a church, in a worship song that Nick's leading, you know what? You won't care if you stand up and you raise your hands. You won't stand up if you literally get on your knees and you start crying out to the Lord. You won't care what people think of you. You won't care because it's total freedom. You'll start shouting. What if you took off, if you're a guy, what if you took off your shirt? <laughs> I clarified. What if Kevin just started dancing around with a towel around? That's what David did. That'd be super weird for all of us. Bring it. <laughs> But here's what I'm saying is I actually believe when that this spirit of worship, this house of prayer continues to go on an uptick, I believe we're getting closer to what we really are supposed to experience and what he wants. There's freedom. And David, I believe, tasted the new, the new covenant. And then he allowed people, Jews and Gentiles, to experience this. Can I, can I close with this? Kevin, can you go back, please, to Acts 15, 17? <laughs> it's a picture of the coming Lord, and who is he inviting? Acts 15, 17 says, uh, go to 16 so you have a picture, right? So after these things, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Don't you have a different picture now? And I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again. Why? So the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name declares the Lord who does these things known from long ago. Oh, by the way, I'm going to restore the tent of David. I'm going to restore the, the Davidic line, which is Christ, so that Jew and Gentile can experience the freedom of Christ.